All right. Hi. Hi. How are you? I know. I know. You're looking at the camera. All right, let's... I gotta clean up a little bit first before I give you some food. Yeah. All right. Just open this up nice and slow. It's okay. It's all right. You're all right. Just gonna clean up all of your... Uh, it's all right. All right, I'm not gonna try to touch it today. No. Just clean up your mess here. It doesn't look like you ate that much, but you did poop pretty good. All right, so we'll get that out. And let's roll up your poop here. Yeah, get that. Let's take all of that, roll this up. Yeah, there we go. And this newspaper is getting kind of wet anyway. Isn't it? Yeah. Oop. There we go. Yeah, my floors are messy. All right, I'm just gonna grab some of this stuff. Yeah. I might as well dump this out while I'm at it. It's a bit of a waste, but I'd rather you always have fresh food than old kind of stale. I'm just gonna dry this off. There. That's better. Hey. Eh? Isn't that better? I'm just gonna put some paper towel down. I forgot to uh, pick up some newsprint for you, so that'll have to wait till tonight. Well, this afternoon. Not really tonight. Eh, this will be nice and clean looking anyway. There. All right. So, Look at all those dandelion flowers. It's all your favorites. Parsnip, watercress, arugula, collard greens, dandelion greens, and dandelion flowers. All right, I'm just gonna put it down. Since you uh, seem to be agitated, I'm not going to try touching you right now. I'll wait and try that this evening. So I guess that's it. Don't want to stress you too much. Nope, I'm going to turn your fogger on for a minute. Let that fog up. I guess what I'll do is I'll just set this on a tripod for now. So I'm going to make myself some lunch quick. Myself some lunch quick. Wow, your humidity's low. Is this other one not running? All right, let's turn that on too. There. So I'll let that run full blast until your humidity goes up. Then I'll turn it back to to normal.
It's okay. Don't need to go all do lap on me. I'm not gonna do anything. All right. I'm just gonna sit here and eat my lunch. How's that sound? Does that sound good? Yeah, I'm gonna eat my sandwich then I'll read to you for a few minutes. There we go. And then I need to go back to work. You're definitely still agitated, that's for sure. I didn't eat all that sandwich anyway. Nope. Oh yeah, your humidity looks pretty good now. I'm just going to move real slow. I'm just going to turn that down a little. It doesn't really need to keep it super foggy in there. No. How's that? Is it still pretty foggy? Well, we'll wait and see.
In the tumultuous business of cutting in and attending to a whale, there is much running backwards and forwards among the crew. Now hands are wanted here, and then again hands are wanted there. There is no staying in one place, for at one and the same time everything has to be done everywhere. It is much the same with him who endeavors the description of the scene. We must now retrace our way a little. It was mentioned that, upon first breaking ground into the whale's back, the blubber hook was inserted into the original hole, there cut by the spades of the mates. But how did so clumsy and weighty a mass as that same hook get fixed in that hole? It was inserted there by my particular friend, Quigwig, Quigwig, <clears throat> whose duty it was as harpier, harper, harpener to descend upon the monster's back for the special purpose referred to. But in very many cases, circumstances require that the harpooner shall remain on the whale till the whole flensing or stripping operation is concluded. The whale, it be observed, lies almost entirely submerged, ex excepting the immediate parts operated upon. So down there, some ten feet below the level of the deck, the poor harpooner flounders about, half on the whale and half in the water, as the vast mass revolves like a treadmill beneath him. On the occasion in question, Queequeg, figure, figured in the highland costume, a skirt and socks, in which to my eyes at least he appeared to uncommon advantage, and no one had a better chance to observe him, as will presently be seen. Being the savage's bowsman, that is, the person who pulled the bow oar in his boat, the second one from forward, it was my cheerful duty to attend upon him when taking that hard scrabble scramble upon the dead whale's back. You have just seen Italian organ boys holding a dancing ape by the long cord. Just so, from the ship's steep side, did I hold Queekly down there in the sea <clears throat> by what is technically called in the fishery a monkey rope attached to a strong strip of canvas belted about his waist. Um, it was humorously perilous business for both of us. It was a humorously perilous business for both of us. For before we proceed further, it must be said that the monkey rope was fast at both ends, fast to Queek Queek's broad canvas belt and fast to my narrow leather, leather one, so that for better or for worse, we too, for the time, were wedded. And should poor Queek Queek sink to rise no more, then both usage and honor demanded that instead of cutting the cord, it should drag me down to it in his wake. So then, a, an elongated Siamese ligature united us. Queek Queek was my inseparable twin brother. Nor could I in any way get rid of the dangerous liabilities which the hempen bond entailed. <clears throat> You're pretty brave with me sitting right here eating like that. Normally you uh, wait till I'm sitting over on the sofa. So strongly and metaphysically did I conceive of my situation then, that while earnestly watching his motions, I seemed distinctly to perceive that my own individuality was now merged in a joint stock company of two, that my free will had received a mortal wound, and that another's mistake or misfortune might plunge innocent me into unmerited disaster and death. Therefore, I saw that here was a sort of interrogum of improvidence, for its even-handed equity never could have sanctioned so gross an injustice. And yet, still further pondering, while I jerked him now and then from between the whale and the ship, which would threaten to jam him, Still further pondering, I say, I saw that the situation of mine was the precise situation of every mortal that breathes. Only, in most cases, he, one way or another, has the Siamese connection with the plurality of other mortals. You know, Darwin, that might be the longest sentence I have ever had the pleasure to read. It's a whole paragraph. Commas, colons, a whole paragraph, and not one period till there. If your banker breaks, you snap. 
If your apothecary by mistake sends you poison in your pills, you die. True, you may say that. By ex exceeding caution, you could possibly escape these and the multitudinous other evil chances of life. But handle Queek Queek's monkey rope heedfully as I would. Sometimes he jerked it so that I came near, very near sliding overboard. Nor could I possibly forget that, do what I would, I only had the management of one end of it. I have hinted that I would often jerk poor Queek Queek from between the whale and the ship, where he would occasionally fall from the incessant rolling and swaying of both. But this was not the only jamming jeopardy he was exposed to. Unappalled by the massacre made upon them during the night, the sharks now freshly and more keenly allured by the before pent blood which began to flow from the carcass, the rabid creatures swarmed around it like a bee in a beehive. And right in among those sharp sharks was Queek Queek, who often pushed them aside with his floundering feet, a thing altogether incredible were it not that attracted by such prey as the dead whale, the otherwise miscellaneously con carnivorous shark will seldom touch a man. <clears throat> Nevertheless, it may well be believed that since they have such a ravenous finger in the pie, it is deemed but wise to look sharp to them. Accordingly, Besides the monkey rope with which I now and then jerked the poor fellow from too close a vicinity to the maw of what seemed a particularly ferocious shark, he was provided with still another protection. Suspended over the side in one of the stages, Tishtago and Dagu continuously flourished over his head a couple of keen whale spades, wherewith they slaughtered as many sharks as they could reach. This procedure of theirs, to be sure, was very disinterested and benevolent of them. They meant Queek Queek's best happiness, I admit, but in their hasty zeal to befriend him, and from the circumstance that both he and the sharks were at times half hidden by the blood muddied waters, those increased spades of indiscreet spades of theirs would come nearer amputating a leg than a tail. But poor Queek Queek, I suppose, straining and gasping there with the great iron hook, Poor Queek Queek, I suppose, only prayed to his yojo, and gave up his life into the hands of his gods. Well, aren't you pretty sitting there? Yeah. I'm glad I put those ropes on your little, your little, um, lamp. Yeah. You're a pretty girl. Yes, you are. I'm trying to look at you without making eye contact. Well, well, my dear comrade and twin brother, thought I as I drew in and then slacked off on the rope to every swell of the sea. What matters it, after all? Are you not the precious image of each and all of us men in this whaling world? That unsounded ocean you gasp in is life, those sharks your foes, those spades your friends. And what between sharks and spades are you in a sad pickle and peril, poor lad? But courage, there is good cheer in store for you, quick, quick. For now, as with blue lips and bloodshot eyes, the exhausted savage at last climbs up the chains and stands, all dripping and involuntarily trembling over the side. The steward advances, and with a benevolent, consolatory glance hands him what? Some hot cognac? No. Hands him, ye gods. Hands him, hands him a cup of tepid ginger and water. Ginger? Do I smell ginger? suspiciously asks Stubb, coming near. Yes, this must be ginger, peering into the as yet untasted cup. Then standing as if incredulous for a while, he calmly walked towards the astonished steward, slowly saying, Ginger? Ginger? And you will have the goodness to tell me, Mr. Doughboy, where lies the virtue of ginger? Ginger? Is ginger the sort of fuel you use, Doughboy, to kindle a fire in the shivering cannibal? Ginger? What the devil is ginger? Sea coal? Firewood? Lucifer matches? Tinder? Gunpowder? What the devil is ginger, I say, that you offer this cup to our poor Queek Queek here? There is some sneaking temperance society movement about this business, he suddenly added, now approaching Starbuck, who had just come forward. Will you look at that cannikin, sir? 
Smell it, if you please. Then watching the mate's countenance, he added, The steward, Mr. Starbuck, had the face to offer that camel, the jalop, that callum and jalop, to Queekly. There, this instant, off the whale. Is the steward an apothecary, sir? And may I ask whether this is the sort of bellows by which he blows back the breath into a half-drowned man? I trust not, said Starbuck. It is poor stuff enough. Aye, aye, steward, cried Stubb. We'll teach you to drug a harpooner. None of your apothecary's medicine here. You want to poison us, do ye? You have got out you have got out insurances on our lives and want to murder us all and pocket the proceeds, do ye? It was not me, cried Doughboy. It was Aunt Charity that brought the ginger on board and bade me never give the harpooner any spirits, but only this ginger jub, so she called it. Ginger jub, you gingerly rascal. Take that and run along with ye to the lockers and get something better. I hope I do not wrong, Mr. Starbuck. It is the captain's orders. Grog for the harpooner on a whale. Enough, replied Starbuck. Only don't hit him again, but... Oh, I never hurt when I hit, except when I hit a whale or something of that sort. And this fellow's a weasel. What were you about saying, sir? Only this. Go down with him and get what thou hast wanted thyself. When Stubb reappeared, he came with a dark flask in one hand and a sort of tea caddy in the other. The first contained strong spirits, which was handed to Quigley. The second was Aunt Charity's gift. <coughs> And that was given freely to the waves. Well, I guess ginger is not popular aboard a whaling ship. Well, I'm just going to finish my uh, my cup of, of Coke and then I'm going. Well, I'm glad you ate while I was here. With me sitting so close, it's uh, surprising. Mm. Maybe the fog made you feel braver. No, the humidity's not that high. I mean, it's... What is it, 60%? I can't see the cameras in the way. When I get up to get the camera... Am I going to see that all you did was eat the flowers? <laughs> I, I hope you ate more than the flowers. You're going to make me feel guilty wasting all that salad that you don't eat. Alright, well, I better get back to work. <clears throat> so I'm going to move nice and slow. Well... It does kind of look like all you did was eat the flowers. That, uh... Oh, don't go on with your tail. All right, I'm gonna turn that down. Set it back to coming on and off automatically. All right. I guess that's it.